Naturalist Charlie Veron is back on Conversations today. Charlie is former chief scientist of the Australian Institute of Marine Science. He's discovered nearly one quarter of the world's coral species, the result of the thousands of hours he spent diving on coral reefs all around the world. So when you want to know the story of the Great Barrier Reef and try and fit the whole thing into just one hour, then Charlie Veron is your man. In fact, he's known as the godfather of corals. Welcome back, Charlie. What do you think? Can we tell the story of the Great Barrier Reef in an hour? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we can try. We should probably start with the basics then. Mm -hmm. Does a reef necessarily need to be coral? No. Uh, reefs can be uh, anything that can live where the land, the sea and the air all come together. It's an environment which doesn't exist anywhere else. It can be occupied by anything, but corals are just particularly good at it. So what exactly is coral? Is it plant? A coral is, is it an animal? It's an animal. It looks like a little anemone. Uh, there are all sorts of different sorts. But the big thing about them is that they've got a symbiosis with these algae, plants and the algae power the coral and allow it to live in this hostile environment. So it's this symbiosis between the animal and the plant which actually allows corals and therefore reefs to exist. So the little bit of, you know, prettily coloured coral that I might have, you know, on, on my shelf at home, mm. what does that relate how does that relate to what's growing under the sea? That's that's a piece of calcium carbonate, that's skeleton. When that was alive, it was covered with a, a layer of cells, which is the living coral, and that lays down that skeleton. So what a coral really is, is things like little tiny anemones that get together and they, they build a house. They uh, build something that is eventually turned into the biggest structures ever made by life on Earth. It is a phenomenon that really has no equal, nothing com comparable anywhere, any end in geological time, any time. You say coral has this symbiotic relationship with algae. How yep. does the algae power the coral? Well, the algae absorbs the sunlight. And just like a, it's a green plant, and it's got uh, photosynthesis, and it produces sugars, and so it actually powers the coral, and it also gives the coral the energy to extract carbonates out of the water to build the skeleton. In other words... It allows corals to make cement. That requires a lot of energy. And they wouldn't be able to do it at the rate they need to do it were it not for the algae giving them that huge amount of energy. The corals can't exist without their algae. It's a weird symbiosis where the corals are captured by the algae and the algae really allow them to exist. And that has probably been, been the case of every sort of reef that's ever existed in geological time because only the sunlight, the power of sunlight captured by green plants can allow a reef to be built. What does that algae that lives inside the coral do for the coral? It just produces sugar for food. And maybe it uh, metabolises waste from the coral. I have had no really good explanation as to why a coral is so addicted to its algae mm. that it can't live without it, no matter how much food it's got. And the algae gives the, the corals its wonderful colours as well. Yeah, it's not the coral, it's the algae. That's why when we have a bleaching, a mass bleaching, uh, the coral just goes white or sometimes a, a bluish colour. But, um, yeah, it's the algae that makes the coral have all these pretty colours that everyone admires. It's and not the coral itself. Is it different species of algae give the different colours? Or uh, what yes, leads there's to different that? strains of algae. But it's not so much the colour. Because a coral lives on, on the knife edge all the time, it has to have just the right strain of algae to enable it to exist in that, in that one spot. It's got to get a, the algae that gives the biggest bang for the buck. And if it's got the wrong sort of algae, it will be outcompeted by another coral. So the corals always go for the algae that, that does the, the best job for them. And that algae varies uh, geographically according to the environment. The problem with the coral now is they've got the algae that is just right and has been right for tens of thousands of years but is no longer right because its temperature is too high and we've got the wrong sort of algae now. And so that means the death of the coral because it hasn't got its, its, its symbiosis in mm. order. 
So for a reef like the Great Barrier Reef to be built, how long does, does a structure like that take to create? Well, it does it in, in stages because the sea level goes up and down. So when the sea level goes down, the whole thing's high and dry. And the sea level comes up, it's got to catch up, it's got to stay within range of the sunlight. So when the sea level went down, Aborigines would have hunted kangaroos on the Great Barrier Reef. It was a, it was a forest. It was a, a, a savannah woodland. They walked on the Great Barrier Reef. They lived in caves under the reefs of the Great Barrier Reef. That's pretty hard to imagine, but that, only, that happened only 15,000 years ago. So it's only really fairly recent. Oh, very recent. Yeah, it's a very recent phenomenon. And uh, it, it changes con constantly all the time. And so corals really build like hell when they can and they hang on somewhere else when the sea level goes down. And then for a, a, a coral reef that's getting the right amount of sun and the right amount of water, how long can it exist for? Does it just go on indefinitely? It goes on indefinitely. It builds and builds and builds until it uh, gets to the low tide level when it can't go any further. Then it can only build outwards. And that's really basically why reefs are so big they can't grow up anymore, so they grow out. And reefs, coral reefs are so important, not just because of the coral, but because those those reefs act as houses, act as cities almost yes. for a whole lot of other species. Yep, about a third of all marine life has some part of its life cycle in a coral reef. A third? A third. It's huge. They're the, the most diverse habitats, ecosystems on this planet. Why are they so valuable to other species? What does a coral reef offer? Well, you can imagine a coral, they're built of limestone, um, so they have all this tangle of limestone. You're a fish, you've got protection in a coral immediately. If you're, if you're a medium-sized fish or if you're a tiny little fish, you go down deeper. If you're a little worm, you're deeper still. And so they, it gives protection for just about anything imaginable. I mean, all right, a whale can't live in a coral reef, but you've got to be awfully big. Uh, um, sharks have their larvae in coral reefs. Um, almost all fish have got some part of their larvae. They live in a coral reef because it offers protection uh, to predators and also to um, the environment. Uh, you can find any sort of microhabitat imaginable somewhere in any coral reef. So they offer all that. So if we get back to the coral itself, Charlie, mm. coral is made up of all these individual polyps. Some are, some are not. Some corals are just one polyp. Uh, but most form these colonies. It's a matter of architecture. A lot of corals just form plates. But if they need exposure to the sun, a solid plate is not good design. A plate that's made up of beams here or there, like a, something an architect might design. They give maximum strength for the amount of building material they have. Uh, they build these amazingly intricately designed structures that can withstand waves pounding, yet they're still exposed to loads of sunlight. And uh, they're really uh, architectural masterpieces of this planet. And they're animals, they must need food. How do they get food? Well, they get the food from the algae and they also capture it at night. Certainly not when the waves are pounding around, that all comes from sunlight. But a bit deeper down, they capture this food from plankton all the time, they, all they night long. They capture it? That sounds very active. What, what well, does yeah, the polyp actually right. do? Yeah, they're, they're, they're very aggressive. They um, have all these tentacles. As soon as something touches the tentacle, it's dead. They, they stuff it in their mouths. And um, you, if you're uh, wanting to see something super violent, shine a torch on a coral at night and all the plankton come in and the corals really get stuck into them. And you see this massive corals and tentacles all with frantically dying plan uh, plankton. And that's um, what you can see with the naked eye, just tentacles oh, yeah, yeah. grabbing plankton and pulling yeah. them in. Mm, plankton, poor little fellas, struggling <laughs> away. And, um, yeah, that's what I first saw when I was at Long Reef. Um, I used to drop worms, in, oh, horrible little boy, I used to drop worms into anemones and watch them struggle as anemones dragged them in and that was it. That's what corals do all the time. And we should pay some tribute to plankton because how important are plankton in the story of the ocean? Oh, hugely. There's some sorts of plankton, especially like krill, which whales eat in the Southern Ocean. They, they stay out in the ocean, that's where they live. But most plankton are larval stages of other organisms. Plankton are the larvae that disperse, that move that species around to find new places to live. 
And if you dive into the water at night on any coral reef, turn on a torch, you just see incredible diversity of just amazing little critters. We know very, very little about them because there's, there's so many different sorts of plankton. Corals eat the whole lot. But they're just really, they just like shrimp or crabs or lobsters, but very, very small. And they exist in, in, in huge numbers. And so much reef life eats them. And so how do corals spread? Usually by one polyp dividing into two polyps and four, eight, sixteen, and so on. Or they have points on branches where they grow very quickly, a sort of big mummy uh, polyp at the tip of a branch keeps on budding off little ones. Uh, stag horn coral, as they're often called, they can grow 30 centimetres in a single year. They can grow extraordinarily quickly. And um, people all over Europe and America have um, reef aquaria, and you can see corals in action in these, in these aquaria. And sometimes the aquarium is just a stuff full of corals. And, of course, one coral bumps into another, and they start fighting. And they're <laughs> very does, aggressive. How do, how do coral fight? Uh, they send out long filaments which attack anything nearby, and they attack each other. And you see these masses of filaments, one attacking the other, and, and one of them wins. And so uh, it starts killing off the neighbouring coral. Uh, it's, a coral reef is really a battle zone. Everything is fighting. And the reason for that is that they really live on a knife edge. To succeed in such a hostile environment, they've got to be ultra-competitive. And so they have just the right algae for the, for the job, and they have just the right growth forms. It's a very, very highly adapted, aggressive environment, which has got no parallel anywhere. The nearest parallel would be a rainforest, where things compete with each other all the time, but um, not to the extent of a coral reef. You say, Charlie, that it's the uh, absence of algae that, that causes this bleaching. Yep. Why does the algae disappear? What happens well, in a bleaching event? It doesn't actually disappear initially. If you've got the temperature going above anything that's ever been experienced in the genetic history of the, the coal, I'm talking tens of thousands of years, the, the algae does its job too well. Like any green plant, the warmer it gets, the more oxygen it produces. And, and that oxygen eventually gets toxic and it starts killing off the cells in which it grows. Uh, the coral can't control how much oxygen is produced. So it's got to get rid of the coral or it dies. But when it does get rid of the coral because it can't, of the algae, because it, it needs the algae, it'll die anyhow. So it's really caught in a catch-22. So the coral gets rid of all its algae, it dies. It gets rid of most of it, it's got a good chance of living and the algae will multiply back again. But um, because we're getting these waves of warming, which is way beyond anything that the whole ecosystem has experienced, the corals, well, they overreact. They get rid of all their algae in it and they die. So the coral has algae internally and on the outside. And the algae on the outside are big. It's like kelp. Great big uh, macro algae, it's called. Um, and that will smother the coral. And so the coral's got to be home for lots of fish and other things which eat the algae. And if those fish are not there, the algae smother the coral. And the coral has to produce this home for the fish, and it needs to be warm enough to do that. So that's why corals only exist in the tropics. Everything's too slow in temperate waters, and the macro algae win. They just smother the coral and kill it. There are different types, many different types of coral, Charlie. What about soft and hard corals? What, what's the difference there? Uh, a soft coral just doesn't produce skeletons at all. They're not related, uh, only very, very distantly related. And there are many different sorts of soft coral, but uh, they cannot build reefs, and so they cannot provide the ecosystem, they can't provide the home. They really are hangers on to the reef corals that actually do build the reefs and there's no substitute for them. Once the reef filling coral is um, dead, the reef dies and everything else dies too. Yeah. Are corals a challenge to classify for scientists? Corals have been collected during expeditions of discovery because they, you can put them in the bottom of a boat and forget about them. Museums were stuffed full of corals and uh, they had 
big boring monographs written about them and there's loads and loads of specimens on display. So they've always been interesting for naturalists and they're pretty. Now uh, where science is we need to work at species level and we need to know what species are and that's what I started working on to do this um, when I was a young guy working out just what a species was and that was completely unlike what uh, my predecessors thought species were. You can imagine a reef slope. A coral at the top of the reef slope gets pounded by the waves so it's thick and nuggety and strong, it has to be. But as you get deeper and deeper and deeper the water it gets kinder and more gentle but there's less light and so the corals change their growth form. It's still the same species but the colony at the top being pounded by waves doesn't look remotely like the one in the, in the gloomy depths. And so that is something that only a scuba diver can see. And so when I started, we had all these old museum volumes, and I'm, I'm talking about metres of, of, of volumes. Sea depth of oh, uh, volumes. stuffy old volumes, and they're awful. I couldn't make it a tale of them. Uh, but I could see what was happening underwater. And so I've spent my whole life fixing all that. Hmm. Hmm. Through that study, Charlie, is, is there a sense of how corals have evolved over time? Are they a very, very old Oh yes, we know an awful lot mm. about that. In fact, we know more about corals than anything else. And the reason is they make really good fossils. And they not only keep fossils of themselves, but of everything else that lives in a reef. So uh, a reef is nature's historians. They have so, so they're so rich in fossils. We can see how they've changed over time. That's something that I've loved to study. I love fossils too. So, um, I sometimes get into, um, shall we say, discussions, a bit of lively discussions sometimes with paleontologists because they are effectively like the old museum workers. They've only got the specimen. They don't know what the species... So a species for me could be like many genera uh, for a uh, paleontologist because they can't see how they change either with time or depth or anything else. It's a very complicated subject. My colleagues and I have been working on that for... Well, my whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. Looking at that historical record, at the fossil record for coral, is it has it changed much over the thousands of years that coral has it, been in existence? It's changed incredibly little, actually. The uh, basic template of most corals that existed in the in the Triassic, that is the first age of the dinosaurs, and if you found if you get a coral from there and you really need to know your coral stuff to be able to know it wasn't one growing on a reef today. That basic design is, is, has worked over 200 million years. Wow. And, it, yeah, it's, um, so they got it right in the first place, and so they've, they've kept it. But the, uh, because corals always live on this knife edge, they're prone to being wiped out all the time, and reefs have been wiped out over and over and over again in the geological record. I'm afraid we're embarking on one of those now. When you say that corals changed very little because it got stuff right early on, mm. what makes it successful? Why has it been able to... Because it lives in an environment which nothing else can. A coral reef has got the highest diversity of life on this planet. Um, but that is because the corals build the homes that other organisms can live in. Now, that's been going on for a very, very long time. So lots of other organisms, almost the majority of major groups, have exploited that. They say, wow, we've got a really good home here. We can live in all the sunlight and we're protected from the worst of the ocean's ravages. And so a coral reef has got all these this, this huge array of fish and holotherians and mollusks, you, well, you name it, they're, they're there in huge numbers and great diversity. It's not just corals. Corals build the homes, but all sorts of things live in it. And it's a bit like if you build a, a house in a zoo, you'd have the house full of all, all sorts of things. And But it's the house that's made of coral, but it's got all these other animals in it. <laughs> In terms of, of coverage on the sea floor, Charlie, how much is reef? Uh, very little because it has to only exist in very shallow water and by that I mean no more than 100 metres. Most coral reefs don't go more than uh, 40 or 50 metres down. They must have sunlight and so uh, you, if you dive down um, 40 
50 metres, you are seeing the corals petering out. Oh, they do go down much deeper than that. And we don't know much about the corals growing in depth because it's beyond scuba depth. Mm. The corals are restricted in where they can grow in for depth and they've got to be kept warm. Otherwise, they can't beat off the uh, macroalgae. Tell me about the spawning events that happen. Well, that's very interesting to see. Corals have to reproduce sexually like, like most life. And a coral is a like a hunk of stone. They, well, the one can't move over to the other and say, hello, I've arrived. <laughs> um, so they get around that by releasing egg and sperm bundles or just sperm or just eggs. But they've got to get their timing right. It's no use one going off today, another one tomorrow. They've got to really get it right, and they do. And when you see that happening, the whole ocean turns pink. There's masses and masses of egg and sperm bundles. And, of course, fish come in to eat it. So all the other organisms growing on a reef, they cash in on it. They do their thing too. So they all do. It's, it's a, just a mass, not only of coral spawning, but everything spawning. Well, how do they know? I mean, what, what makes it happen at a particular well, time? Well, that's that varies from place to place, and it's really quite clever. On the Great Barrier Reef, the ocean needs to be warming, so they keep track of that. They keep track of the phases of the moon. Uh, they time it down to the nearest day. It, it really is, and you can see the corals waiting for that. As I say, they're like little anemones, and they, they get their egg and sperm bundles, and they hold it just ready for the right time to release, which is usually about two or three, two or three hours after sunset. You can predict this very well, and you can float around and wait for it, and then, then it all happens. Well, what's and it like when, you, when you're there in the rain? It's reef? like being out in the rain when the rain goes, is going up, not down, and, <laughs> or, or, or snow, but it's, they're pink normally in average colour, and there's just so masses of them. The whole world is just little tiny little, little pink blobs just floating to the surface, and the whole surface turns pink. How long does that last for? It lasts for days sometimes until the currents move it away to other places, which is how coal disperses. And some of these uh, egg and sperm bundles, they turn into larvae and uh, they, they travel far and wide. And some have caught across the entire Pacific Ocean. Um, they get algae in their tissues and they can, so they can, they, they're fed and they just can drift all the way across to the far eastern Pacific and it's really incredible journeys and before we discovered that there was all sorts of way out theories as to how corals dispersed all over the world the popular one was they sort of hung onto continents as continents drifted around how often do those spawning events happen is it Every once year. a year once yep, a year for most corals more often for some and that is the origins of my um, belief in what we call reticulate evolution, where the larvae, as they move around, they're the pathways of genes. They actually move the genes around, because they are the genes. And that's how corals f appear to form a species here, but that species changes there because it inter interbreeds with that species, and all these connections are broken and reforged and broken over time, but a relatively short amount of time. So corals don't really evolve much by Darwinian evolution, as I said before. Um, a coral from the Triassic looks much like a coral you find today. They change, but that change is not necessarily change for improvement, it's just change, and that change is brought about by the ocean currents carrying the larvae around. And so for those larvae that get carried off on the ocean current somewhere far off from mm. where they began, how long would it take for that larvae to grow and form and spread into to a reef? Well, most of them never make it. They just die. I mean, a tiny percentage ever get towards the reef. But they've got means of chemically sensing a reef. Um, reefs give out all sorts of chemical cues. A coral may, for example, come all the way from New Caledonia and reach the Great Barrier Reef, and they're floating on the surface of the water, and we don't know all that much about this, but the larvae say, hang on, wow, there's something around them, and they start diving. They go down, and they find a place to attach, and you've got a new colony starting a long, long way from where the parent was. So if we think about the Great Barrier Reef, over what sort of period of time did that emerge? Oh, that's very ancient. OK, what is accepted science is Australia broke away from what is now Antarctica, from Gondwana, and... 
about halfway along the journey to where it is now, it got warm enough to have corals growing. Now, Australia was then isolated on land from every, everywhere else. That's why our marsupials have proliferated and, and, and didn't have all the competition with more advanced mammals. But not so the, the marine world. The Great Barrier Reef would have come into range of larvae from Indonesia about 20 million years ago. And so uh, I believe that's the age of the Great Barrier Reef right back then. It got warm enough, got within range of drifting larvae. This is my theory, by the way. And so that would have populated all northern Australia and, and New Guinea and also western Australia. And so you even have coral reefs growing down south as far as Perth. We've got coral reefs growing in New Zealand. I mean, they're not there now, but um, in geological past times, they have been as Australia gradually moved further north and became what it is now. It's still moving. It's the, Australia is the fastest moving continent of the world, and it's um, six centimetres a year or something like that. <laughs> it's, but the reefs have existed in northern Australia for an enormous amount of time. This is Conversations on ABC Radio. Charlie, you've been sort of laying out the the age and the, the extraordinary age and the wonder and the miracle, really, of these incredibly complex creations. But the threat that they're under now is something that we need to look at. And the main threat comes from acidification. Explain to me what that is. What's the, where's the acid coming from? Well, there's two threats. One is the more immediate one that we're suffering from now, and that is called mass bleaching, and that is created by the water being too warm and the algae within the cells of the coral is giving off too much oxygen, and when the coral expels the algae, it turns white and dies. And that's happening all over the world now, and it has probably killed off half of all corals now. It really is very, very serious. Ocean acidification is quite a different thing because it is caused by carbon dioxide also. If we have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as we have now, it dissolves in the water, it forms carbonic acid, and that changes the chemistry of the surface of the ocean. That, that will never go acid. There's not enough acid in the world to do that. But it will uh, change the chemistry enough that corals can't lay down their skeletons. Why not? What, what does the change because, in acid do to that forming of the skeleton? Well, the seawater needs to be strongly alkaline to be able to allow that chemical process to happen. And if it's even slightly less alkaline, it slows that process down and down and down until eventually... The, uh, the coral, well, it suffers from coralline osteoporosis. It just gets weaker and weaker and therefore more vulnerable to everything. The other problem is that larvae, when they're settled, they can't get going. They can't, they can't secrete their, their basement carbonate and uh, they just die. So the whole phenomenon of ocean acidification is chemically it's very simple. We've only just really recognised how important it is. Uh, in the geological past, it's happened many, many, many times. And it is really the founding move of, a, of what we call a mass extinction, where huge numbers of species die out and go extinct. And if you uh, acidify the oceans, uh, you wipe out coral reefs. They can't grow. And as soon as you wipe out coral reefs, then at least a, a third of all species haven't got that part in their life cycle and that's a domino effect and so you give if you like mass death throughout the oceans it's a horrific thing and it's happened before so if it's if it's happened before uh, with these other earlier events of mass extinction mm. is there anything different about what's happening now yes what's happening now is it has no precedent in geological history. We are producing carbon dioxide at a rate that is completely unlike anything in the geological past. Now, there's, some, there's one very famous exception, and that is when 65 million years ago an asteroid hit the Earth, 
Uh, it was a gigantic asteroid. It hit the Earth around about the Gulf of Mexico, and it would have shook the whole Earth, and every volcano that was thinking of going off went off, and that would have put up a spike of carbon dioxide, the likes of which the Earth had, had never seen. But what we're doing now is producing carbon dioxide at a rate, except for that event, at a rate which has no, no parallel in, the, in, in geological history. So the, the oceans can't get rid of the carbon dioxide they, they absorb. They just go more and more acidic. They, they don't go acid. Uh, there's not enough acid on Earth by a fraction, I mean a huge amount, but they, they just, it just changes the chemistry. And why is that rate, the speed at which it's happening, why is that so significant? It's happening at a huge rate because humans are producing the carbon dioxide and we're producing carbon dioxide vastly faster than all volcanoes combined. Uh, volcanoes produce an almost trivial amount of carbon dioxide compared with what humans are doing now. And it's not only carbon dioxide, it is also methane. And so we are producing it ourselves and then the warming that's causing it, it is releasing methane from like the, the steppes of Russia where it was frozen or under the uh, North Pole where it was frozen in massive amounts. And that methane is also greatly contributing to this blanket of warming that's uh, changing the temperature of the Earth. In, in people's mind, they get muddled with, with weather events, like today's two degrees warmer than it was yesterday, perhaps. A, a two degree warming of the Earth means an enormous amount of melting of existing ice, creating sea level rise, but the big thing is that it, it, it is releasing masses amount of carbon dioxide. And the more you release, the more you get. And so it's going to have this cycle of, of action and reaction. Mm. And that's, that's happening. And there's no stopping it. The speed with which it's happening also means that the organisms don't have time to make adaptations yes, in response right. to mm. that. How is that significant in terms of coral, which, as you've said, has existed for, for millennia? How is it not able to make changes to adapt to this warmer well, water? It, it has in the past, yes. Um, we've had much higher levels of carbon dioxide millions of years ago, but those levels took hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, to build up. And so, yes, corals could adapt. They kicked out the algae that was good for them at, at that initial time and got themselves different sorts of algae that would produce less oxygen for the temperature. That, so that, yes, certainly that symbiosis can change. But we are increasing carbon dioxide at such a rate, it's way beyond the possibility of, of evolutionary change. Mm. Some corals are going to do better than others, but it's wishful thinking to imagine that evolution happens in anything, and anything remotely like that rate, unless you're, a, what, a bacterium or something. Uh, and as we've seen, they're not changing, they are bleaching and it's getting worse. Where and when did you first notice changes to the reefs that you knew? Well, I, I think I was the first person ever to um, photograph a bleached coral. Where was uh, that bleaching? Uh, it, was, it was in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef. It was only in one colony. And I thought, well, that's a weird thing. It was still alive, but it was white. Well, most of it was white. And I um, marked it and I came back a few months later and it was dead. And I thought, well, that's odd. I wonder what happened. But it was years after that that um, I first saw a mass bleaching in Japan. And again, I thought, what on earth's going on here? There's someone tipped something incredibly poisonous into the water. And I realised that was the mass bleaching had started. When was that, Charlie? Uh, it was the early 1980s. And, so, and then I've been seeing it on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, it used to be only occurring and what we call an El Nino year, that's a natural cycle, and uh, now it's occurring every year. It's worse in El Nino years, but uh, the way it's developing, it will happen every year, whether it's an El Nino or not. And what are the follow-on consequences for that bleaching? What happens in that ecosystem? Yeah, well, you can imagine that, OK, you've got a forest, and a fire goes through the forest and, and looks terrible, uh, but that forest will regenerate and regrow. In fact, a lot of forests depend on fire, right. Uh, maybe it'll take 15, 20 years for the trees to grow back. 
But if that fire comes back in, in seven or eight years, well, hang on, it's, it hasn't recovered from the last lot. And then the fun, if it gets down to that fire coming through in every two or three years, that forest is dead. It, it will die because it doesn't have the time to regenerate. And that's what's happening with coral reefs now. If what we've seen in the northern Great Barrier Reef was only going to happen once in 15, 20 years' time, yeah, we could expect uh, a lot of recovery. But I'm afraid it is uh, wishful thinking because the temperature of the ocean is keeping on getting warmer and warmer and warmer and will do every year. This is easy to track now with satellites. And that is something that will cause more and more frequent bleaching. You say you first started seeing this without really knowing what it was in the early 1980s. When did you first start putting that together with the science around climate change? Well, I followed the science and then I didn't get into the early arguments. I took an interest in it and then it got to me, to my own mind, so important that well, my whole family, we all packed up and went to France and we lived in a very secluded mountain retreat in an olive mill in France and I took crates and crates of books and references and I spent one and a half years just reading and studying and this from all sorts of point of view, chemically, geologically, physiologically, ecologically, all that. And I wrote a book putting all this together. It caused a lot of big reactions and one of them was that an organisation... This guy in charge, he rang me up from London and he said, Charlie, come out of my account and talk to you about your book. And I said, yeah, Paul, sure. What do you want to know? He said, no, 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 I want to come from London to talk to you about your book. All right, OK. Um, and yeah, he arrived just next week and he said, what would you just say if we called an emergency meeting of the Royal Society in London, had David Attenborough chair it and Googled what you had to say all over the world? And I said, I was thinking, this guy's a nutter. And about a fortnight later, I said, it's all arranged. <laughs> it was. You can't it, really refuse an invitation like that, it, can you? No, of course I can't. <laughs> and and um, it was arranged and it all happened, just as he said. So what happened? What was the name of the talk that you gave? It, it was, is the Great Bay Reef on death row? It was a gloomy talk. Now, I'm not used to giving gloomy talks. I'm not a gloomy sort of person and I really hate talking on this subject. But it's something I have to talk about. And the reason that it was me it was because I had done so much background reading and stitched together the evidence from all these various different fields. Now, when all this was happening, there were these climate change denialists, and I realised gradually the extent of their ignorance. They were geologists, so they thought they, their geology was right, or their physiologists, they thought the physiology, but they didn't stitch together the whole picture. And I did because I just took a whole lot of time out of work and just spent it researching it. What sort of response did you get in London when you gave that talk to the Royal Society? Um, I gave the talk and then question time started. And one and a half hours later, the Master of ceremony said, look, we've got to end this now. It's after five o'clock. And poor David Attenborough was on the stage with me the whole time. He was over 80. And poor guy, he, he was absolutely exhausted. Uh, he'd been through a battleground a meeting of scientists before that and shared that also. It was an incredibly good audience. It was really good. And I got all sorts of really good questions. Uh, including from a lot of climate change sceptics. Uh, and I always encouraged that. If they kept an open mind, then I could show them. And I don't blame sceptics at all. If you first saw a jumbo jet, you can't believe that thing could possibly fly. But if you see it take off, then really you find out it can. And so uh, it was an incredibly good audience, and it went all over the world. And one of the things in my life that I think is very much worthwhile now, I'm a coral biologist, um, and this was just other fields which I really needed to get into, and I did. So this talk you gave on um, whether we were looking at a death sentence for the Great Barrier Reef met with a receptive scientific audience. What was it meaning for you personally to, to join these dots about this uh, environment look, it, that it, you loved? I, I, words, I can't answer that question because it is so horrible for me. I've been diving on the Great Barrier Reef for over 40 years and to have to 
be the guy that projects into the future. All this doom and gloom, it, it, it's been gut-wrenching. It's I mean, horrible. It's been a, a really a horrible part of my life. I've, I've had a, you could say, a wonderful life diving in coral reefs all over the world. People say, yeah, they joke, you'd be paid for doing that. Well, it's actually a lot of work involved, but it is a work of love. None of this is a work of love now. It's, it's a work of absolute hatred. And it really upsets me and it just eats me up. Because you I hate see what's seeing happening. what I'm doing and I hate having to talk about it all the time. I hate having to make people aware of it all the time. It really... It, and, 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 and I do this a lot. And it, it, it's, it's, it's very hard on me, actually. Because the damage that we've done is so bad or because we're not accepting of that yet? I mean, what, what's giving you the hopelessness? Well, we're much more accepting now than, than when I started out, when my colleagues started out too, and some of them have been at this longer than I have. I feel it's... I have to keep on keeping on reminding the world about what's happening. I've got young children, and they're going to live in a hell of a world. We've got two degrees of warming coming up. Two degrees is a joke. Uh, it's, we've got much, much more coming up, and... Frankly, the predictions that I gave at that Royal Society meeting so far have been absolutely spot on. And the reason for that is that I did so much research. It is firstly horrible for me to, to know what the future holds. And then I can't forget it. I can't put it behind me. I get reminded all the time. And I have to have this interview. I would much rather... And not have this interview, I'm afraid. I, I don't won't want... take that personally, Charlie. I know what you mean. <laughs> no, I don't. And, but honestly, it, it's, it's been very hard on me uh, as a person. Of course, you talk about a thing in this world I love more than anything else, except my family. I'm always talking about its destruction. If we continue on the trajectory that we are on now, what is the future for the reefs? I promise myself I'm not going to answer that question ever again. Sorry, I'm not. Why? Because I'm a scientist and that's all I am. I say what the science says and if I deviate from that, I say, well, as a personal opinion, and I think I, a little bit earlier on I deviated from it as a personal opinion and I always say that. Otherwise, though, I say what the science says. That's what I am, a spokesman for the science. And the science is looking very, very grim. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do have a huge faith in humanity. I think the um, Ford Motor Car Company had an aeroplane in the air in the beginning of their Second World War within, within a year. Humans can move very, very quickly if needs be. So they're moving quickly now. I come from one of the worst countries in the whole world. Uh, of course, Australia is lagging behind just about everybody except America. We've even okayed more coal to be dug up. We're doing more than any other country to create conditions that will destroy coral reefs. I speak up about that. I have no choice, but it's, it's something I really am afraid. I hate doing, but on the bright side, we have some terrific technologies coming up. I mean, they really are smart. So it's a race against time. What we've got to do is stop relying on fossil fuels and put all our energies into renewable. Heavens above, look at all the sunlight Australia's got. Yes, there are problems, and of course there are problems, and, but there's been nothing like the problems there'll be if we don't get on with it really quickly. Uh, I don't know if you've got children, or, and I have, but they're going to face a very, very grim future. Can we stop the acidification that's happened already? The acidification is not... It, that'll be very slow to set in. Mid-century, it'll take by mid-century to really... It moves from the poles where carbon dioxide is really soluble up to the tropics. It won't be affecting the tropics until mid-century uh, to, to a big, big degree. But it is unstoppable and it will affect all the oceans at all depths everywhere. It has happened before over and over again. Coral reefs have been wiped off this planet five times totally. I had to start all over again. Uh, but many, many other small extinctions. And by that I mean uh, the likes of the Great Barrier Reef would turn into a, to a, a slime plain of nothing living on it. Um, but a few corals will hang on here and there in places where conditions are not so bad. 
that's not a mass extinction, that's just a local extinction. But um, these take hundreds of thousands to millions of years to recover. And so humanity has only got here and now. They've only got one, one go at it. If we trigger off even one of these minor extinctions, the coral reefs as we know them will effectively cease to exist. So what, what might be needed to preserve coral species for the future? Well, frankly, uh, on that one, I don't think it really matters because we can wi- if we wipe corals out, then we wipe out the whole ecosystems. So, yes, we can keep corals going. Corals grow in aquaria beautifully. Um, they're all over the world now. There's massive aquaria with stuff full of corals, and they'll keep on keeping on. We can keep all species of corals in aquaria, but what we can't do is keep the oceans from destroying reefs. And so... It's no compensation for me to say we can preserve corals from extinctions. It's like we can preserve snow leopards from extinctions by keeping them in zoos, but snow leopards don't create the environment for everything else where they live. And so it doesn't come to my rescue at all. It's got to be about saving the oceans. It's got to be about saving the oceans. It's saving the environment. And there's only one way of doing that, stopping carbon dioxide. That's the only way. Charlie, why do you say that you like to sit on your coffin? What does that mean? Um, I do that often, actually. <laughs> well, several times in my life, people don't like the expression, but I think it's fair enough. Well, I had a, I've had a very, very complicated life, and it's taken many entangled paths, and sometimes I like to take a, a deep breath and, as it were, imagine that I'd reached the end of my life and I want to look back and ask myself, was it a good thing that I did this? Was it a good thing I did that? And uh, I write many books, and should I have written this one or not? Uh, Should I have given that Royal Society lecture or not? Uh, Or should I have, as I was for a long time, been a a bit of a bureaucrat at at the Strange Student Marine Science, where I was a chief scientist? How much time should I have spent at meetings and planning and so on? So that's what I mean by sitting on my coffin. And when I sit in my coffin now, I see um, my life really has been quite purposeful. I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago. And I think most of the time I've been at uh, meetings has been time wasted. In terms of this part of our environment that's so important to you, Mm. when you sit on your coffin, do you think you've done the best thing you could be doing for its protection? You'll never do the best possible, but I feel happy so far at what I have done because I've alerted so many people to the dangers of carbon dioxide. I could have done more, but I don't think I could have done more and still kept the level of sanity that I still have. I think if I had done more, I would have been in a padded cell, honestly, I really do. I've pushed myself to the limit. And it's a very difficult thing to say no to someone who's got a good idea and wants to come and see me. It stops me from doing other things. Now, I've been building this great big website with some of my colleagues, and which is the biggest, most powerful conservation tool ever. And we've been doing it for 10 years. And so I weigh up the amount of time and energy I spend talking about climate change or writing articles or these sorts of things, I weigh up that against the time spent on this website, which is hugely time-consuming. And I've also got to raise money for it. And so it's a juggle. I'm 71 years old now. I don't think I'm going to be able to stop for another decade at least. And honestly, um, I would look forward to a time when I can put this behind me, but that time is not even remotely arriving yet, unfortunately for me. No, exactly, Charlie. We do need you to keep going for a good while yet. Thank you so much, Charlie, for your work and for being so generous with your time. I've learned so much. I've really loved talking to you, Charlie, yesterday and today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, actually. Dr. Charlie Varon, he's former Chief Scientist of the Australian Institute of Marine Science, and we'll put the link to Charlie's website up on our own, abc.net.au slash conversations.